What does research tell us is the last thing you're going to see before you die? Your children. Interstellar is a precise scientific film where love saves the day. My connection with Murph, it is quantifiable. It's the key. That might sound paradoxical, since our society tends to frame science and sentiment as an either-or. But Christopher Nolan's film argues that to safeguard the future of our species, we need both hard logic and warm emotion working together. Love is the one thing we're capable of perceiving that transcends dimensions of time and space. Maybe we should trust that, even if we can't understand it yet. After failing to find a new home for the dwindling population of Earth, Cooper seems doomed to die in a black hole when something supernatural happens. Cooper seems to be behind the wall of his daughter Murph's childhood room. He reaches out to her through a doorway in time. I'm gonna find a way to tell Murph, just like I found this moment. How? Love, Tars, love. This love between a father and daughter is the key to saving humankind from extinction. And it's also the key to understanding Interstellar's deeper meaning. So let's take a look at the movie's ending to understand what happened and what it all meant. Before we go on, we want to talk a little bit about this video's sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is a superb online learning community with thousands of classes about everything. Photography, illustration, music production. Click the link in the description below to get two months access to all classes for free. The Earth has been devastated by dust storms and blight. Humanity is an endangered species. We didn't run out of television screens and planes. We ran out of food. A mysterious wormhole appears, allowing Cooper and his team to travel far beyond the solar system to search for a planet suitable for life. One system with three potential worlds? A long shot. As they head toward the third and final planet on their list, only Cooper, Amelia Brand, and the robot TARS remain of the original crew. Cooper decides TARS must detach to reduce the weight on the spacecraft. Oh, we have to shed the weight to escape the gravity. Once TARS is sucked into the nearby black hole, there the robot can collect the quantum data needed to figure out how to control gravity in order to lift the remaining people off Earth into space and save them. It's our only chance to save people on Earth. If I can find a way to transmit the quantum data I'll find in there, they might still make it. Early in the film, we hear that Amelia Brand's father, Dr. Brand, has been trying to figure out how to do this without success. Suddenly we knew that harnessing gravity was real. So I started working on the theory and we started building this station. But you haven't solved it yet. Cooper also detaches his lander from the spacecraft to increase Brand's odds of reaching the last planet. Newton's third law. You gotta leave something behind. He hurdles into a black hole before winding up in a place that looks like Murph's bedroom. This strange, M.C. Escher-esque reality is actually a tesseract, a construct that gives him access to the fifth dimension. They constructed this three-dimensional space inside their five-dimensional reality to allow you to understand it. Yeah, that ain't working. Here, every moment in time exists at once. All of this is one little girl's bedroom, every moment. It's infinitely complex. Cooper uses Murph's books to send a message in Morse code. Earlier in the film, we saw that Murph believes this message comes from a ghost. I figured out the message. One word. You know what it is? Stay. In fact, it's Cooper's desperate attempt to stop his past self from leaving. Since at this moment, he has every reason to regret giving up his life with his family, only to end up stranded in space. Don't let me leave, Murph! But back on Earth, adult Murph puts two and two together. You're Murph, my ghost. With the help of TARS, Cooper realizes what he has to do. You have worked out that you can exert a force across space-time. Gravity. I sent a message. Affirmative. He uses dust to communicate the coordinates of the NASA base, which again gives us a full circle moment, since we saw him and Murph read these coordinates and visit the base earlier in the film. By passing on the coordinates, Cooper is setting his past self on track to go on the interstellar mission. Finally, he uses the watch he gave Murph We count the data into the movement of the second hand to send her the quantum data she needs to save humankind. 
Once Cooper has passed on these messages, the Tesseract collapses, hurling Cooper into space. He wakes up on a space station named after his daughter. Where am I? Cooper Station. Currently orbiting Saturn. Murph's mission was successful. When Cooper and his now elderly daughter reunite, she urges him to find Brand. Go. In the film's last scene, we see that Brand did reach the last planet, humankind's next home. Interstellar's ending leaves us with a few lingering questions. Like, number one, who are the bulk beings that TARS refers to near the end of the movie? The bulk beings are closing the Tesseract. Cooper theorizes that the Tesseract was built by future humans. Cooper, people couldn't build this. No, no, not yet. One day, not you and me, but the people, the civilization that's evolved past the four dimensions we know. It replicates for Cooper how they perceive time. You've seen that time is represented here as a physical dimension. This recalls something Brand says earlier in the film. To them, time might be another physical dimension. To them, the past might be a canyon that they can climb into, and the future, the mountain they can climb up, but to us, it's not. Nobel Prize winning physicist Kip Thorne, who collaborated on the film, has argued that we wouldn't see a bulk being if they passed through our environment, but we would see and feel a warping of space. Like in the handshake scene, Brand thinks she's making contact with the bulk beings, who are referred to throughout the movie as simply they or them. What is that? Later, we see this is actually Cooper reaching out to Brand as the Tesseract collapses. Cooper isn't a bulk being, but in this moment, he gets to experience the way they can manipulate space-time. And this leads us to another question. Number two, if the bulk beings have so much control over time and space, why do they need Cooper at all? Here's Cooper's own answer. They have access to infinite time and space, but they're not bound by anything. They can't find a specific place in time. They can't communicate. That's why I'm here. Even though this future civilization has powers we can't imagine, Cooper's human limitations provide something essential. He can connect to specific moments in time, and he's bound to another human being. First-time viewers may think that Cooper is traveling backwards in time. How else could he be the ghost leaving messages in the past? In fact, Cooper is outside linear time, so he's not rewinding. He's just able to access all moments in time at once. This may connect to the movie's biggest unanswered question, which is number three. How do the future human beings exist at all? Since Cooper needs the Tesseract they built in order to save humankind, but the future humans can't exist until he saved the people on Earth. Some viewers consider this a plot hole. But if these bulk beings really view time as a flat circle, then causality, befores and afters, wouldn't matter for them in the way they bind us. Question four. Is Interstellar scientifically accurate? There were the occasional moments with Kip where I would sort of say, look, we really have to find a way to make you know this happen, uh, and you know he would go away and do calculations and, and find ways that um, could accommodate both the demands of the story and also uh, real physics. Thorin writes in his book, *The Science of Interstellar*, that he had two ground rules when he signed on to the film. Quote, one, nothing in the film will violate firmly established laws of physics or our firmly established knowledge of the universe. Two, speculations, often wild, about ill-understood physical laws and the universe will spring from real science, from ideas that at least some respectable scientists regard as possible. Of course, a lot of this movie is speculative, but it's also not impossible. Thorne said that time travel is the one element of Interstellar that doesn't rest on proven science and was, quote, much less constrained by the laws of physics because we don't understand the laws of physics in that domain yet. Time is relative, okay? It, it can stretch and it can squeeze, but it can't run backwards. It just can't. Number five. 
Many of Nolan's films have the setup of a protagonist who's separated from his loved ones, usually by death or the burdens of responsibility. How long have you gone? Hard to know. Yes. I've got kids, Professor. Get out there and save them. Nolan uses this premise to investigate unfulfilled love. This love endures even when its continued existence is completely illogical. You love people who have died. Where's the social utility in that? None. In Interstellar, the characters who love each other but can't be together are Cooper and Murph. I need to fix this before I go. I'll keep it broken so you have to stay. But here Nolan is doing something a little different than in his other movies. He's not just looking at how connections between individuals last against all odds, but how all of humanity finds a way. The film pushes us to care about Cooper and Murph's bond in order to broaden our view, as a link to make us invest in faceless future generations. The last people to starve will be the first to suffocate. And your daughter's generation will be the last to survive on Earth. Consider Dr. Brand's great lie. He admits that he deceived Cooper and the other astronauts into going on the interstellar mission. He never had a plan to save the remaining people on Earth. There was no need for him to come back. There was no way to help us. His only true mission was to use fertilized eggs to restart human civilization on a new planet. Why keep building those stations? Because he, he knew how hard it would be to get people to work together to save the species instead of themselves. Or their children. Bullshit. You never would have come here unless you believed you were going to save them. Dr. Brand's lie is unethical. But on some level, the movie itself is trying to get us to think big picture as he does. We must reach far beyond our own lifespans. We must think not as individuals. But as a species. All of this might remind us of the current conversation about climate change. It's natural to care more about the people in our lives today than about future people we'll never know. We can care deeply, selflessly, about those we know, but that empathy rarely extends beyond our line of sight. Some, maybe most of us, are more like Matt Damon's character, Dr. Mann. He's focused on the immediate future, his own survival. I knew that if I just pressed that button and somebody would come and save me. In contrast, Dr. Brand's logical solution to the problem may strike us as a little too heartless and impersonal. Monstrous lie. Unforgivable. And he knew that. Instinctively, we feel that saving our species is more than just passing on our genes. It should also involve protecting the people that already live. The movie tells us that if we want real solutions to combat global problems like climate change, we need more people like Cooper, who integrates Dr. Mann's personal emotion and Dr. Brand's impersonal logic. Cooper's deeply felt love guides him to make logical choices for the good of all people. Mankind was born on Earth was never meant to die here. He makes a personal sacrifice for humanity, ensuring that Brand has a chance to find our species a new home. One clever way that Interstellar trains us to work our empathy muscles is through the way it uses the word they. They are beings of five dimensions. The characters call the future human civilization by this pronoun. They saved us. Huh. What the hell is they? And that's why they want to help us, huh? They place the wormhole, allowing the astronauts to get to the other planets in the first place. Someone placed it there. They? And whoever they are, they appear to be looking out for us. And of course, they built the Tesseract. So the they here are not abstract strangers. They're descendants of the present humans who are helping and looking out for their ancestors. They've put potentially habitable worlds right within our reach. While it can be easy to dismiss future people as anonymous, the movie reminds viewers that these future generations are us, the offspring of our children's children. Don't you get it yet, Doris? They're not beings. They're us. 
Seeing elderly Murph surrounded by her family at the end of her life helps us make this empathy leap from loving our own immediate families to loving our ancestors and descendants to loving all people. Ultimately, what is humankind but a collection of distant siblings, parents, and children anyway? Young Murph is haunted by a ghost who turns out to be Cooper. But after all, an ancestor is a ghost, someone whose presence is felt after they leave this world. I call it a ghost because it felt, felt like a person. This connection between generations is supernatural, surpassing both logic and time. It's about continuing to love someone, even when you can't see them or they can't see you. I love you forever. You hear me? I love you forever. Interstellar tells us that science and emotion overlap, and that rather than embracing one over the other, we should let the head and the heart work in tandem. Near the beginning of the film, we get this exchange. We learned these coordinates from an anomaly. What sort of anomaly? I hesitate to term it supernatural, but it definitely wasn't scientific. We also hear... It's not a ghost. These anomalies do come from gravity, but they also come from something so far beyond our imagination that they seem almost magical. In many ways, the supernatural, the unexplained, and the illogical are what drive scientific study. Love isn't something we invented. It's observable, powerful. It has to mean something. One of the most logical decisions we see in the movie backfires spectacularly. Brandt doesn't want to leave the ocean planet without Miller's data. We're not leaving without her data. And her stalling cost the mission 23 years. What's this gonna cost us, Brandt? A lot. Decades. On the other hand, she makes the illogical case for traveling to the planet of Wolf Edmonds, the man she loves. I'm drawn across the universe to someone I haven't seen in a decade, who I know is probably dead. But this emotional instinct proves correct. Edmonds did find the only habitable world. And that makes me want to follow my heart. At the movie's climax, science brings Cooper into the black hole, but love enables him to reach Murph. And Cooper's plan of passing her the quantum data depends on his faith that she will come back for the watch that he gave her. How do you know? Because I gave it to her. Like her dad, Murph believes in the power of love. But I knew he'd come back. How? Because my dad promised me. These two are driven equally by logic and emotion, and this reflects Nolan's larger views of truth and storytelling. It sort of feels to me like that for something to be true, yeah. there ought to be an element of feeling and intuition. Right. It shouldn't just be hard yeah. math. Right. Space movies often confront themes of fear, the unknown, and isolation from society. But Interstellar is rare in its genre because it leaves us with a deeply positive message. It encourages us to be curious about the greater universe. Well, we used to look up in the sky and wonder at our place in the stars. And to broaden our view of humanity. This film wants us to know that what really defines us is love. Love is that fifth dimension. Love is that thing that travels through time, forward, backwards, up and down. Love is what humans add to the universe. Maybe it's some evidence, some artifact of a higher dimension that we can't consciously perceive. And recognizing how small we are in the grand scheme of things doesn't render that love unimportant. On the contrary, it just might save the world. They didn't choose me, they chose her. For what, Cooper? <laughs> to save the world. This is Roman Muradov. Roman is an illustrator and cartoonist whose clients include The New York Times, The New Yorker, and Penguin. And Roman teaches a class on illustration, on Skillshare. This class is for anyone who is tired of waiting for inspiration and who wants to expand their visual vocabulary and learn some new visual techniques.
This is why we love Skillshare's service. The classes are taught by amazing, accomplished working professionals in design, photography, social media, business, entrepreneurship, and more. In fact, Skillshare has actually helped us at Screen Prism learn more about animation and design. They offer 20,000 classes about any skill you might want to learn, all for less than $10 a month. Right now, you can get two months access to all their classes for free. But that's only if you're one of the first 500 people to click the link in our description below. It's a great deal, so hurry up and don't miss out.